Hello and welcome to another episode of a Brothers Creed podcast where we talk about motivation, experiences, and exploring the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers. I'm Ethan. I'm Jared. And today we're going to talk about public speaking and doing it with confidence. Public speaking and the ability to speak publicly is such an important thing that anybody should be able to master. And there is such a fear out there about this. So we're going to talk about how to give how to give good speeches how to talk with confidence when you're speaking to a large group or just with small groups or or one-on-one and how to capture attention of the room. So it's going to be a great episode. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. An interesting topic. Did you know that 75% of people on earth struggle with glossophobia, which means fear of the tongue or fear of speaking? Hmm. Uh, it also kind of it has to do with other social anxieties that are mixed into that. Uh, and that is according to the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, some even claim that people are more scared of public speaking than they are of death. So I, I couldn't quite confirm that, but I, I did hear a lot of people say that on a lot of the research I did. Uh, so interesting that people have such a fear about public speaking and where that stems from. You know, I think sometimes it stems from people don't want to be embarrassed. People don't want to be judged, be judged. People are afraid to put themselves out there and be vulnerable because they can be mocked very easily. But you'd think with the social media these days, people put themselves out there so much that it's kind of like, you know, you're you're fine putting yourself out there on social media and, you know, doing whatever crazy thing you're doing, but you're not, but you're afraid to go stand up and like speak about something you're passionate about. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's that, that immediate response, right? That, um, I don't know. It's like the pressure. It's not like you can press send and then just like forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a good point, you know? So, um, yeah, so Ethan, you're gonna you had you were gonna start us off with seven elements of public speaking. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so when I was kind of researching into this and um, kind of planning it out, my my mind went directly to okay, well, you know, if I want to be good at public speaking, then I need to understand what public speaking is. And so I kind of was digging into it, and 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 there's seven elements to public speaking, and we'll just kind of walk through them and talk a little bit about each one. But um, number one is the speaker. Right. Um, the success of the talk is based off of the credibility, the preparation, and the knowledge of the speaker about the topic. That's basically the whole thing, right? The responsibility is on you. It's, I mean, if you're talking to a group of people, they don't really, maybe they might feel an obligation to listen, but the responsibility is yours to try to present something to them that they can understand and and uh, accept. So uh, I think that's a that's a super powerful one right there. And that is something that I have a whole section on here I wanted to talk about from the, the Wolf of Wall Street himself, Jordan Belfort. He talks more specifically about that. And maybe I'll share that later on in the, in the podcast here. But having establishing credibility, mm-hmm. right? What's that guy on YouTube where he's always like, he's always like, oh, these are my Lambos in the background. And he would like rent out an Airbnb and rent out these Lamborghinis. Uh, was it, it like, something Ty Lopez or something yeah, like that? Yeah, 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 that was it. And here I am in my garage with my Lamborghini. Yeah, you see all these books behind me? Yeah, this is this is how much I research, and all of it's just like a rented Airbnb. Thing is that that guy, he, in his videos, what he does is he establishes the credibility right away with the, with with that. Yeah, this is like this. You know, he shows us stuff. I, I sold a million dollars in my business. So he ought to, so his videos are kind of, built that way to convey first of all credibility uh yeah preparation and then some of the other things that uh yeah Jordan oh, this, Belfort talks about this, later. yeah and, and knowledge was one of the ones too oh you know he's read 150 books and he must you know be really knowledgeable which I don't know, maybe he was but so almost like 
if someone is, is trying to establish that credibility and someone is trying to establish uh, their uh, dominance or, or per- I would almost be, little, especially nowadays, I would be a little bit cautious uh, about that. You know, with Ty Lopez, it was all a facade. Yeah. And, and I guess he used that facade to get to a place where he, it wasn't a facade. Yeah. I mean, he I faked he's it made a lot he of money. Faked it. He faked it until he made it literally. But I think that it's, there's so many scammers and pranksters out there that are like, oh, yeah, you know, come follow me. Side story uh, that has to do with this. I worked, when I was working on my old job, there was this guy who was working there, and the guy was an absolute fail. Like, <laughs> he was doing another job while he was supposed to be doing his job uh, at my old company. He, he was doing his a side gig. He had a side. He has own. He would bring in his personal laptop, and he had a, a third personal monitor at work. And he would be working on his personal laptop on his that was connected to his personal monitor with a separate keyboard, separate mouse, most of the day. And then when me and another buddy were like, "Hey, what is that monitor for?" or he would quickly turn it off and say, "None of your business." If I got up, stood up, walked to the bathroom, he would quickly turn off his monitor, and. So we're like, whatever. Eventually, this guy ends up getting laid off uh, in this big layoff that happened. But he didn't tell anybody about it until like the last day. And he's like, oh, yeah, they did it last minute. But really, he got laid off with everybody else that, <laughs> that was like that was laid off that time, which my buddy was laid off at the same time. And so it was kind of weird because my buddy was like, all he knew that this guy had been laid off, but the guy didn't admit to it until like the day before. He's like, oh, yeah, they just laid me off last minute. Anyway, so after... This guy on LinkedIn, he creates this profile of him, and he's like this guru of like personal finance. He he got into some kind of MLM sales company type thing where he like he's a consultant and he'll help consult you on your finances. It's like not 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 like a legitimate financial advisor, like a multi level marketing financial advisor. And he tried to badger my buddy. Gee, oh, what, what, what's the condition of your finances? Let me help you out. I'm, I'm a, what are your goals? Yeah, and he's like, dude, I know. You, he's like, I have no interest I know, in anything. I know your work ethic. I, yeah, I know exactly what you're doing, and you have absolutely no credibility. Like, you're the most dishonest person I know. And so sometimes people will try, but if you look at his LinkedIn profile, and he, my buddy sent me a screenshot. I not, I wouldn't dare look at it because I don't want it to show up that I looked at his <laughs> LinkedIn profile or that I had any interest in him at all. But... Uh, and it's like the most fancy LinkedIn profile you've ever seen. It looks like he's you know got all these credentials. He's like, yeah, I worked at the, I worked at the bank and I did all this stuff and I'm so awesome. And people, you can make a resume look whatever way you want to. You can bend it to whatever you want. And I was just like, man, you got you got to be cautious about people's credentials. Yeah, but if you're aware of maybe the, their history or their credibility, you've had experience. Yeah, and especially in that industry. Uh, one more thing. Sometimes I do consulting in that industry, and as one of my side businesses and when you're looking at the the CEO of a company I have to look at what their prior companies were because a lot of time these CEOs will be from prior companies that went bankrupt they would have multiple failed companies that were busted or shut down for fraud or that they were at a prior company who was engaging in fraud and they got shut down by the F, uh, by the governing US like regulatory bodies and so you know, you got to know some people's history sometimes before you jump into bed with them, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, that makes complete sense. So Sorry for the tangent. Go no, ahead. No, that's fine. Oh, so, so, so the first one was a speaker, right? We talked about that. And actually, we get down, we talk a little bit more about that in another one. So the first one's a speaker. Second one is the message. Um, the speaker should deliver this message in a clear way, which reaches the listeners. Uh, third is the channel. So that's basically the communication channel. What do you... Um, what is making this conversation possible? Is it over the phone? Is it on Zoom? Is it uh, at church in front of a congregation? Is it at a conference where you're standing in front of an auditorium? So that's the or channel. Or a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, then you have the listener. So the listener is the receiver of the message. Um, and this can be one person or a whole group of people. Um, you know, I think maybe your tactics and your strategy might change just a little bit when you're talking with one person versus uh, a whole group of people, but I think still they're, they're a lot of the stuff is similar. Uh, the next one is the feedback. So this is the response from the listener or the receiver, and it may be verbal or nonverbal. You know, if you are talking with someone and that person is, you can like read their cues and they're scrunching their face or doing whatever, or they're, you know, confused or maybe they're kind of dozing off, right, as you're talking to them, then they're not very interested. 
or yeah. you know but I've if you're before. yeah but if you're in there and you're talking with a gr- group a crowd of people and and i don't know maybe they're cheering or they're going oh or ah then you know maybe you have their attention a little bit more yep so the 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 feedback is important um, then you have another one, which is interference. This is something that, that goes along with um, kind of reputation a little bit and that credentials. So interference is anything that can affect the communication process. It can be internal, which is like it could be a prior relationship with the speaker and the listener or maybe an experience that they had, or it can be external. It could be loud noises or a buzzing or a ceiling fan that's really loud. Um, and Or a car horn. You ever see those... Uh, what was it Biden was like giving a speech and these guys were just laying on their car horns and he couldn't he had to stop because he just left because no one no one could hear yeah so I mean it's just those are those are interferences yeah right then the last one is the situation so situation is just the time the place you know the location of where the actual conversation happened so those are kind of the seven elements of a speaking engagement whether it's to a large amount of people or to a single person. Um, and now that we kind of understand, and we kind of talked through a couple of those and, and, and where we're going with those, now maybe we could talk about, you know, or give some examples or talk about some certain elements of maybe the do's and don'ts of public speaking. Because I think both of us have had, I mean, other than the podcast, I don't know, I, I don't know would you consider this public speaking? Uh, I don't think I would. I, would I more, mean, because it's just you well, and I sitting here chatting and like it's not like we're speaking in front of an audience I will say that after being on the podcast and uh, after listening to myself over and over again and editing all these different things and trying to edit out ums and yas and nos and and kind of that filler. Oh yeah, there's a lot of filler words. I think if I compared maybe this episode to one of our first episodes, hopefully it's a little bit better. I think if I compared this episode to maybe three episodes ago, I'd probably better. (laughs) Because so, I'm more cognizant, I'm like, wow, after doing all this research, I'm like, wow, I do a, a lot of these things, yeah. especially with filler words. So what are some of the things? So w- some of the things I, maybe let me talk about some of the how-tos. Uh, one is not getting psyched out. Uh, you have to kind of prep yourself. Oh, some would say that act like you're speaking one-on-one to somebody. Uh, I've almost... Sometimes when I've been in public speaking or when I'm speaking in public, I almost have to get a little bit mad. I get a little bit like the Hulk, you know. I get a little bit angry. And What's when the trick? I'm always angry. Yeah, exactly. Once you get a little bit angry or a little bit mad, and this is a personal thing. I haven't found this, found this anywhere. But this is just kind of me, I guess. But I get a little bit angry, and I get a little bit like, I'm going to tell them what, you know. And I, I don't want it to, to go, come across my speech, but I get a little bit angry like that to embolden me to to that takes away the fear of of speaking so that when i get out there i'm just like i'm gonna lay it out and i'm gonna i'm gonna give it to him even though i don't present it like that i mean i might give the talk in a loving way but to kill the nerves it right helps, off the it helps bat, you to overcome it those helps nerves overcome that's that's something mo- most of i would say my public speaking engagements are church related um you know speaking to a congregation of 100 200 people is is pretty common and um, I also have, you know, work things where I'm, we're speaking at work, but maybe there's smaller engagements than that. But um, I feel the same way. And typically what I do, and this almost happens every time, is I, when I get up there, I'm sitting and we're kind of, they're starting the meeting and I'm, I, I, that nervousness, I'm pretty calm going into it because I know I'm prepared. But then it's like that 10 minutes before that nervousness just builds and it kind of builds and builds and builds. And I have to like just just stay as calm as possible. And I, I, I just kind of like take some deep breaths and everything. And I have noticed for me personally, every single time I give a speech, whenever I go up, it is like the first probably five to ten seconds, I'm very nervous. Like I can feel it in my whole body. And yeah. I'm just like... Uh, you know, kind of freaking out a little bit, but then after that five or 10 seconds, it's just, it kicks in and it's flows. Yeah. And totally. So that's just something that, that I've noticed for me and that I'm kind of cognizant of. And then I'm saying, okay, well, this is going to, this is going to happen. How do I calm myself down? Or a lot of times I'll do it at the beginning of a, um, 
of a speech or something like that is I'll tell a little story, a little antidote, maybe a, a yeah. little joke or something like that in that first 10 seconds. Yeah. Something that's going to kind of break the ice. It's going to make me feel better. It's going to make them, you know, maybe pay attention a little bit more. And Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm in a position uh, in our church where I actually go around and speak in different uh, to different congregations once every other month or so. So I'm regularly speaking to large groups of people, you know, maybe 150 to 200 people. And like you said, but for me, sometimes you get those nerves. For me, being prepared is super important. Uh, if I am prepared, then I don't have to be thinking about oh, well, reading or anything like that. I just know what I'm going to say. And some of the ways, tips here is to structure your talk where you make mental benchmarks in your head on what you want to discuss or the plan. You got to prepare going in. So what I will do is I won't write out word for word what I'm going to say. And, I, and a lot of people suggest that. And I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't do that either. What I do is I write, uh, I'll write topics. So on my, on my sheet of paper, I'll have story one. Uh, you know, so let's say a uh, story about the kids. And then I will go down and then I'll say, you know, scripture. And I'll have the, the scripture written out and I'll read the scripture. And then I'll say, you know, cover this topic or talk about these things or share these scriptures. And then I'll say story or maybe if I'm teaching a lesson, sometimes I'll like teach a lesson in church. Or if you're teaching a, a lesson to, you want to engage the audience, right? So you're like, so I'll do a question mark and I'll put all my questions in red. Sometimes even if it's a rhetorical question, I'll put the questions in red so that I know, okay, this is a spot where I can maybe pause, maybe get some feedback. Uh, if you're speaking over like a pulpit, usually you don't get that kind of feedback or, or people answering. But if you're like t- teaching a, a lesson, uh, then yes, you do. And so I'll, I'll do that. And then so just structuring it with mainly bullet points and then knowing your material good enough to where you could just glance down your sheet of paper and then talk off the bullet points. That is super helpful. And then you're not reading, and when you're because when you're reading, you're going to lose your audience, and that's what so, something that I, I did find that a lot of people say: don't read uh, what you're what you're doing. So uh, a little bit about the structure of a talk. You, you mentioned this earlier: tell a joke or something at the beginning to get comfortable. At the intro, you got to say something that's going to hook people in. You've got to hook them, and then you have to provide that supporting evidence of uh, of what you want to tell them or what your talk is about and then at the end end with a powerful conclusion and that is really the kind of the recipe for success and one of the other things I said I like that was said about how to give powerful speeches and how to not get psyched out act as if it's going to go well so like almost get your get your mind just like oh this talk is going to go great afterwards you know people are going to say hey great job thank you for that optimism is key yeah so act as if it's going to go smoothly expect it to go smoothly and then uh I would say practice. Practice small first. Uh, go to your work and say, hey, can I, you know, I'm interested in this. I have this talent. Can I present this to our, our team? Maybe a five or six people. And then present it to the team. And then say, you know, does, would anybody else be interested in this? And then maybe present it to a larger team. Or, or maybe go and to your local church or scout troop or, or whatever and then present something and teach something. Uh, Start small and then ramp up from there. And then before you know it, you'll be talking to Madison Square Garden, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think one of the things is to practice. And not just practice the, your, your specific speech, but just just doing it, right? The more you do it, the yeah, more you'll exactly. get comfortable with it. Yep. So the more speeches you give, the more you're going to feel comfortable with it. Um, just kind of for me personally, whenever I am given the opportunity to um, to to speak to a group of people, some of the things that I do in just my step to step by step process is I will uh, prepare m- more than I need. So if oh, they, yeah, so if definitely. They, so if they tell me, "Hey, you need 15 minutes. You're going to speak for 15 minutes," then I'll prepare for 25 minutes, and maybe I will have it all lined out and say, "This is my 15 minute speech." But then I will have an extra 10 minutes of stuff to say, if I need it, I can go here. Or an extra story within it. And, and all, yep. like you can, so you can compartmentalize it. And you can say, okay, I'm leaving out this story. I'm just skipping to the next section. Yeah. That way I don't kind of get you know 10 minutes into it because I was a little nervous and I spoke a little too fast. And then I'm like, uh, I'm out of material. And oh, yeah. so this is the end. Um, so I prepare more than I need. Yep. I will practice. Because the, the worst feeling is 
running out of, is is finishing too early. Yeah, because you're like, oh, I'm running out of time. I'm running out of material, and now I have to like make something up that I'm not prepared for. That yeah. is the worst. Yeah. So then I will once I have my material prepared, I will practice and I will time myself. I'll you know just put a timer on the thing, and if I'm supposed to go for 15 minutes, then I'll put my timer up and I'll stand up and not just read through it, but I will stand up and I will give it like I'm talking to a group of people. Um, sometimes if you can get somebody, you know, a, a loved one or whoever else just to listen, sit there and listen to you, then that's, that's good as well. Um, before I get up, I talked a little bit about that. I'll just kind of take some deep breaths, try to calm down and c- curb that, uh, nervousness a little bit. And then I love to tell stories, uh, tell stories in my, my speech or my talk, uh, is what it's called sometimes as well. We've, we've talked about the power of storytelling, right? As if we done that before. I think we did. I mean, we we do that all the time. I mean, tell a lot of stories. Yeah, but. yeah. I, the power of storytelling is unbelievable. And people, they love stories. They want to hear stories. That's how people learn. They won't pay attention to anything you say. You can share with them all these kind of... If you're like, you say, let's get talking in church. You can share with them scriptures and quotes or all this kind of stuff, cool things. But when you share a story, that's, a, that's what they're going to remember. They're going to say, oh, I remember that story that he told me about this, this. And then he related it to, you know, the gospel in this manner or, or this life principle in this manner. And I really like that. That's what they're going to remember. They're not going to remember any quotes or scriptures. Yeah. And, I, and I've said this quote before, but information without emotion is forgotten. Absolutely. Um, I always I was like that quote. But um, I have some other ones. Oh, go, go ahead. So these are a little bit more like when you're actually doing it. Uh, posture and body language is important. Stand naturally. Uh, it will communicate that you're calm and prepared. Pander to the audience. You kind of mentioned this about what the audience is, you know, r- you know, squint, they're like their eyebrows are scrunched, or how would you call this? Ruffled, eye- furrowed, brow. furrowed brow. If they have a furrowed brow, you think you're like, oh man, I'm saying something. So maybe you can adapt. If, if it's or in a somebody's situ- booing you. If it's in a situation, well, that's a little bit different. Yeah, if you're in a situation where you can be like, ask questions, like, are you understanding this, or you know, whatever. But if you're just kind of speaking to a hundred people, you might not get that opportunity. But and I think in general, people are respectful as an audience. I yeah. think probably one of the biggest risks is just boredom. Just people, just people just zoning out. Yeah. And you know what I hate what people do, especially uh, when they're giving talks in church, they're like, Oh, I didn't prepare for this talk very well. So you have to bear with me. And I'm like, you know what? You already lost me. You already yeah. lost me. And you told me that you didn't care five seconds of your talk. You already lost me. Now I don't care what you have to say because you already told me you're poorly prepared. And why would I want to pay attention to someone who's poorly prepared? Yeah. So, um, that's, that's a great point. So that, that's just, that was on my list, but that was something I just thought of. So don't make statements to sound like questions. And this is just something generally what, when you're talking, uh, on work calls, yeah, it could be like when you're public speaking as well. But like even with your friends, make statements like they're like they're not questions. So if someone asks you something, say it with confidence. Don't say it like a question. So like how would, let's see. Uh, so like let's say like this flag behind us would say, "Is this color yellow?" Or nah, that is a question. <laughs> how would we? What would be a way that? Example? Well, I I, I kind of see. Or it. you could say it's yellow. Like, see how my voice went up? That's a kind of a, yeah. it's yellow. It's kind of questioning. Or you could say, as opposed to say, it's yellow. Yeah. That's more confident. I find that with my kids a lot. And I'll ask this, this so this will happen. It'll be like, hey, son, what color is that flag? And he'll go, yellow? And I'll go, are you telling me or are you asking me? Yeah, exactly. Like, that. that's, are you telling me? You asking me? He goes, it's yellow. Okay, great. You're right. Yeah. You're perfectly right. And so it's just, it's it's things like that all the time is, uh, you say things like you don't believe yourself, and then it's, well, are you telling me or asking me? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I don't, I don't believe you. Whichever you're doing, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So just changing your tonality is important. Uh, believe what you're talking about and speak to it. Uh, people, people can sense your passion and and the truth that you're trying to convey. So if you have, if you really believe what you're talking about, but if you don't believe something you're talking about, you probably shouldn't be talking about. Yeah, just talking about it. Uh, use the power of the pause, and this is something that I. I was going to need too. to work on instead of using filler words like um and ah and and you could just pause, collect your thoughts. And it also allows the audience time more so than like preventing you from saying filler words. It allows the audience time to think about what you've just said. Hey guys, just wanted to take a quick break and say thank you for listening today and invite you to support us on Patreon. 
As a loyalist supporter, you get access to two additional episodes per month, which are not released publicly. You can find the link to our Patreon page in the episode description. Let's get back to the show. I love using the power of the pause to recenter someone's attention on what I'm talking about. So let's just say for me, this happened actually last Sunday. Somebody was speaking and I'm sitting there. I've got four kids, so I'm trying to you know, draw a truck for this kid on this tablet. And then I'm trying to help this kid put this sticker on this thing. And I'm trying to, but at the same time, I'm trying to pay attention. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening, right. But I'm, I can't just like intently be staring at the person that's talking. And I, I was listening or whatever. Um, but the person that was talking, they were just talking. And then all of a sudden they stopped talking and it just went silent. And that just that little two seconds, three seconds of silence caused me to look up to see what's going on. And I looked up and I refocused on the person that was talking and then they started up again and, and I was, I was back with them. Yeah. And that there's, there's, I, I like to use that all the time when I'm talking because if someone's on their phone or if someone's not paying attention or whatever else, you just, if they stop hearing you talk, if they hear you stop talking, then they're going to look up because they're going to think something's changing or that they need to pay, you know. Can I, tell so. you, can I tell you a funny story about that? Sure. So that happened to me one time. I was just sitting managing the kids or whatever. And this this girl, she was probably 15 or 16. She was talk, She was giving a talk in church uh, up front. Uh, and all of a sudden, I just, she just stopped talking. And I, and I was like, same thing. I looked up at her and she passed out. Uh, on the stand and there was a guy sitting right behind her who was a member of like kind of leadership he stood up and he literally just caught her she fell back into his arms and like her arms like were over he, he just put his arms right under her arms and she was totally passed out and he just was like standing there like uh <laughs> and then her mom Help. and then her mom ran up <laughs> and uh apparently the girl hadn't eaten that morning and whatever else but uh, and the nerves and a lot of times if you like lock your well, knees also, and you can also restrict blood someone flow stood up but also someone in the congregation stood up and said she's gonna pass out and then uh, and then that guy stood up and he like kind of like stood up and looked around and then he kind of was like trying to look around at her face because she was standing there and then she passed out right in his arms wow, that's and so that was kind of a wild story but he got you with the silence she got that's you right. with the she silence got, she got with the pause i was like what's going on i was like oh dang well i've done the same thing Side story to that, I've kind of done a similar thing too. Typically in church, at the end of a of a of a talk or a speech or whatever, someone they'll say, you know, "Amen," and then the congregation will say, "Amen" as well. Uh, this was a lot of years ago, but I did a similar thing where I wasn't really paying attention. I didn't actually didn't have kids at that time. I just wasn't paying attention for one reason or another. You on the, your phone? The person <laughs> the person stopped talking, and I looked up and said, "Amen." nobody else said because they weren't done talking and so i was just it was dead quiet every there was like a hundred people in this room and i go amen and yeah, everybody yeah. looks at me and i'm like oh shoot you're like hallelujah <laughs> i'm feeling it yeah amen, it was, brother. i'm feeling it you're feeling your words you're yeah like, it was like, okay funny. it's funny um that's awesome but uh the five p's of presentation i looked up was uh, planning preparation practice or consistency which is actually is not a p but uh uh, practice and performance. Uh, a lot of my do's were the same as, as yours. Practice your presentation. Introduce yourself to the audience. Maintain eye contact with the audience. That's and exactly what I was just going to say, eye contact. Yeah. What I like to do is if I'm, when you're talking with a single person, it's important to make eye contact as well. Um, now, don't be like staring. Uh, yeah, don't be like a freak about it. But it's important because when you make eye contact, especially when someone is talking, and you're listening, it is almost proof to them that you, I'm listening to what you're saying. You're validating what they're saying. Yeah. Um, always ask your audience for questions, um, potentially use props or handouts or videos if, to add interest if you can, uh, stories. Uh, another one, so some of the don'ts was try not to pace around too much if you're nervous. Try not to fidget with your hands or with a cord or with a paper or something that's in your hand. Avoid reading slides is what you had to avoid just reading things the whole whole time. Obviously with quotes and stuff like that, you can, but uh, talk steady and not too fast, not too slow. My only rebuttal to that one is you have to talk, you have to kind of talk with variance. 
you know, sometimes you might changes in tonality. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you might slow things down to make a point. Yeah. Or, you know, sometimes you might get a little bit more high pitch in what you're saying. And then sometimes you might come down a little bit. But and that's so, pitch and tone. That's not speed. Yes. Yes. A lot of times people will speed talk. They'll just be like, because be they get so nervous. Them. And what honestly, sometimes for me, not so much anymore, but when I was first at, in my career, I, I was doing cold calling as like a, like a financial sales rep. I was, a we were, we were selling our, our managed option strategy to these to financial advisors. So, so you had I a script? was right out of school. No, I didn't have a script. My, I built my own script. And so I was right out of school. So I was, you know, very fresh. And I was calling financial advisors who were in many t- cases were CFAs and like very experienced in the financial realm. Uh, they had lots of clients. And I was trying to pitch our, uh, our, our strategy. Our, thir- our, our We were a third party yeah. money manager. We were trying to pitch our option strategy, which is options. So it's already complicated enough to a, a financial advisor. And when I would get someone on the call, I wouldn't breathe. Like literally I would be like, yeah, I'm so think uh, like, yeah, my name is Jared. I'm calling from, uh, you know, this, this, you know, this business. And I, I want to talk to you about our managed option strategy. It's really cool. I think that you would really like it for your clients. And if you think that you'd like it, it's going to be awesome. And it's, we only have a 2% management fee and it's so cool. And you never know what's going to go on. And then, you're and then I'm like, and then I'm like, and I had to push, I had to push mute and so I could go. <sighs> and so they wouldn't hear me cause I'd push mute and then, and then I'd go off and mute and I'd talk again. I wouldn't breathe. And so like, that was like a huge thing for me at the beginning. Cause I just would just choke up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, cause I was so nervous and I was making like 60 call. I mean, I was amateur hour numbers. I was making 60 calls a day and that seemed like a lot at the, the time to me in the financial world realm. That's amateur hour, but still it was a lot. And I was like, so nervous. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I've definitely had times like that too, where I've, you did I, sales too, right? Out of yeah. I think, and that was my next story was going to be about, I think everybody who has done any, any sort of public speaking, they have botched at least one thing. I mean, like you, you, you finish it and you get out and you go, that was terrible. <laughs> like that sucked. Yeah. And I, I've had a couple of those, right? Hopefully uh, I've, I've luckily, I, I think I've had more good ones than bad ones, but yeah, right when I, m- my first job out of college, I was doing uh life insurance consulting and uh, like final expense insurance and life insurance. And part of that position, what we would do final is final expense. Final that's, ex- a, that's such a funny way to say like, yeah, death, like death cost of of death. Yeah, final expense funeral. insurance. That's what's called. I know. I know. That's just like that's such like a nuanced thing. People might not know what that means. Like final expenses, like funeral costs, coffin, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, the it's final countdown. To yeah. Basically, it's a it's a portion of life insurance that covers your um your end of life costs, yeah, your yeah. funeral costs, and different stuff like that. So, um, we would hold these these community ed- education events. And it was kind of part of my my role as a consultant for this business that I was working with um, that I held these community events. And we had like over 100 people come to these community events. And a lot of the people, they are you know in their 50s, 60s, 70s, like they're very educated people or they're very uh, you know well-to-do people. And so they would come in, we'd have like a big dinner, and then they would sit down and they would eat w- dinner while we would give them this large presentation. The presentation was probably about forty-five minutes. We present we presented the uh, the basically your pitch, right? Your, your yeah, your story, your product, and why it's important, and everything else. Well, I had done it a couple times. Uh, my first time, my regional rep had been with me. We kind of tag teamed it together. But then on the other ones, I was kind of not on my own, but I was I was kind of the foreman, the forerunner of it. And we on this particular one, there was a new guy that was with me and it was his first time. And he wasn't, he was kind of one of those guys that really did have that fear of public speaking as well. And he told me before and I was like, okay, well we practiced this thing. We went over the slides, we practiced the slides and everything. And so I got up there and I started and I kicked this off and I spoke for about 20 minutes and then I passed it over to him. And the next 15 minutes was probably the most, boring 15 minutes of of everyone in that room's lives really it was just he just choke yeah it was it was all over the place and it was i mean he would bounce from one idea to another idea to another idea to another idea and 
I couldn't even follow what he was saying. And it was it was rough. And I mean, people knew people knew that he was trying and he, he could just tell he was nervous. And people are most people are kind. Right. Yeah. And it was kind of a close quarters ish, so people weren't too bad falling asleep and plus they were eating too. So one guy's like, like, Can I get another beer? This is <laughs> this is killing me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh pun intended. Yeah. Um so, you know, a- a- afterwards we we finished it out and everything and and we had a a good night. Um we got some referrals and different things like that from people, but we talked about it afterwards and he was like that wasn't very good, was it? And I was like, "Well, I mean, it was your first time and I mean, no, it wasn't very good, but it'll obviously get better." And and I talked to him and we, we kind of came together with, well, "Well, what was it, right?" And cause some of the things were his body language. Um, his body language was, there was like a podium there, which is fine to have a podium, but the whole time he was just like grasped onto the podium and he almost was like hiding behind it. Really? His his shoulders were just really hunched over and he was he was a, a good looking, broad guy. His shoulders were all hunched over. He was trying to make himself as small as possible. Um, Interesting. He was talking very fast, even though he had a mic, he was talking very fast and then he was talking like, like very slow, like or very soft and everything and... It was like, I don't know. It was like he was trying to be like Eminem up all up here in the mic and stuff. And well, lots of people have never even spoken into a mic before. You know, yeah. they have to get a little bit accustomed to it. Yeah, and so it, it was good. And the next time we did it, he really mellowed out, and kind of that stress kind of went away. And and a lot of it is speaking with confidence. And the thing is, is, the guy knew his stuff. He wasn't. I mean, he was new, but he knew what he was talking about. I mean, he could have answered questions, and he 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 was on it. He was educated on the topic, yeah. Um, but it's just a matter of uh, just that confidence. Just talk with confidence, oh, yeah. I, and and to to finish that up, um, the audience will mimic your enthusiasm. Yeah. So, however you are acting, the audience tends to act that same way. Just in general, if you get up there and you're excited and you're 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 moving around, or you're telling jokes, or you're you're, you're you're talking about something that's interesting or that at least you think is interesting. You're presenting it in a way that other people would think is interesting. The audience is going to, to react the same way. Yeah, l- let's, let's share an example of that. You got an example that you want to okay. share. So we've so got some examples that we want to share with uh, everybody. Some of our, we, we each have a speech that we brought to the, to the table here and uh, we're going to share one. All right. So, um, I guess this doesn't really need any backstory, but this uh, clip is from the movie Independence Day, right? The the aliens are attacking. The entire world is kind of joining together for the final invasion. Yep. And this is this is how it uh, comes off. Good morning. In less than an hour, aircraft from here will join others from around the world. And you will be launching the largest aerial battle in the history of mankind. Mankind, that word should have new meaning for all of us today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interest. Perhaps it's fate that today is the 4th of July. And you will once again be fighting for our freedom. I just got chills. Not from tyranny, (laughs) oppression, or persecution. But from annihilation. We're fighting for our right to live. To exist. And should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday. But as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight, we're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Yeah, so... uh... I love that speech. First of all, if you don't love that speech, you're not an American. <laughs> <laughs> we will not go quietly into the night. Yeah. So f- I think that um, one thing that's important with it, I, I think it with great speeches is there's like a crescendo. It, it's almost like a song in that it starts out. Like if you notice, he started out very calm 
and then it crescendoed in him yeah. almost yelling that we're going to go get it. And then you could see how everybody reacted after like, yeah, you know, so that that's kind of music helped. In the well, background. the music helped in the background, but it, but that's his voice went that way too. And like you said, the audience mirrored his passion and yeah. his dedication. And it, that's the word I would use, right? His passion. He, th- that really, I mean, maybe, I don't know, in the movie, it didn't go into this. Maybe he did prepare that, but, you know, obviously it's a fictional thing, but it might have just been off the cuff. But whatever, he he was speaking with passion, he was speaking with confidence. And, it that yeah, that build up and that confidence, I mean, it, I, I love that speech. I, actually, I still get chills every time I listen to that. Yeah, me too. So We haven't heard good speeches like that in, honestly, a long time. Biden can't speak off the cuff, and Trump never had good speeches like that because no, he also all he did was speak off the cuff, and it was never very polished. Yeah, that's but, one of the, one of the people that I always uh, and I I should have pulled a clip about it, but um, some of the things that I've seen this is before my time, but some of the videos that I've seen of Ronald Reagan speaking, yeah, um, have been really good. It's just yeah. uh, he's he's told like jokes during his speeches, and he's. Um, you know whether you're you're on political side or not, but just he's very clear and concise in what he was saying. Um, it just yeah, it was one of the things. Well, let's hit the one that I was uh, that I I brought up here. This is one from John F. Kennedy in uh, it's, it's known as the Moonshot Speech, 1962. Uh, this is just a clip from it. it's it's pretty long, but this is just a short clip of it. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So, for me, that that speech is... It kind of influenced me a little bit. One, I think that if you listen to that, he made a joke. He said, you know, about Rice University playing Texas, and everybody started laughing. And he actually, it kind of, spe- it kind of shows his uh, savviness around speaking. He paused and he said, "We choose to go to the moon," and then everybody started laughing. And he said, "We choose to go to the moon," and people started la- kept laughing. And so he just kind of paused for a minute because he didn't want people to laugh. He didn't over want people his next to statement. Oh, laugh over his next statement, which was, "We choose the moon to go to the moon because it is hard." And uh, so that just kind of shows his his savviness around public speaking and where and then the, the timing matters. Uh, and so for me, that speech, you know, it, just the context of that, the the content of the speech in doing things that are hard just because they're hard. Uh, that was part of the reason why I decided to do my master's program uh, in, in data science, because uh, that was one of the things that was extremely hard for me uh, is programming and coding and all this kind of stuff and I was like you know what I want to do something that is challenging I want to do something that is hard Uh, not be you know to to prove to myself that I can do the hard things and so that that was kind of uh, part of the reasoning why I decided to do that Uh, and and the program was extremely challenging but I I made it through and I'm glad that I did that good we don't do these things because they're easy we do them because they're hard because they're hard yeah exactly (laughs) So what a cool speech. And then the whole speech is like, I think, 20 minutes, but uh, very, very good speech. And he talks about what's interesting in that speech. Maybe we'll post it on Instagram is he talks about like in the context of human history, like how many years it, it was like he's like a year ago. If, if you just cram it all down, like all the all of human history, you cram it down into just maybe a year's time. You know, it was only, only a year ago when the wheel was invent the wheel was invented. He was like, you know, he says, this is only last month that the steam engine was invented it was only yesterday or it's only like two hours ago that electricity was invented and, and, and you know he just talks about the acceleration of technology really cool speech yeah but that's great I, I think we've talked through some good examples i think we've talked through some great do's and don'ts um i think one of the one of the things for me um is just 
speak with confidence and and be prepared. I had one thing uh, that with the Wolf of Wall Street thing I was going to share. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Jordan Belfort, who's uh, people know him as the Wolf of Wall Street, he was uh, very he ran a like a investment shop back in like the nineties where. Uh, he did some shady stuff and got put to jail for insider trading. But he's a he's an excellent salesman, and he was basically able to use his salesmanship to manipulate people to to buy stuff, and then he would pump and dump these stocks. But uh, anyway, he, he now he's a uh, he's been barred from the financial industry, but he now he's a a kind of a mentor and a he's out of jail. Obviously, he's a sales mentor, coach, sales coach type thing. And when he talks about building rapport with clients, he says you you have to do build rapport within the first four seconds. And how you do that is, one, you have to show that you're sharp as a tack. Two, you have to show that you're super enthusiastic. And that's not like, don't be like, eh, like crazy, crazy. Not spastic, like, enthusiastic. Yeah, it should, like, like a, there's an underlying enthusiasm about what you're doing, and you're excited to be telling them. Nothing, he says, nothing sells like enthusiasm. And then the third one was he that they need to perceive you as an expert in your field. You need to establish that authority right away. And that's why that was talking about that Ty Lopez guy. He establishes his authority, his authority or expertise right away in every single one of his videos. And that's something that probably is why he's so successful. Uh, the, the next thing he talks about, he, he says it's not in the words that you say uh, that's going to get this stuff done. In fact, sometimes he said it's, it's about 75% in the things that you and other things, not the words that you're saying that actually affect it. He said, one, it's in the tonality of your voice. Intentionally, he said, you intentionally use your tone to become persuasive. So he says, like, speaking with tonality hooks people in and makes them pay attention and it gives the speaker control. So if you're able to control the conversation, you are in a position of power. And that doesn't mean talk so much. In fact, a lot of times it means listening. You being able to direct the conversation to where you want, that gives you the power in the conversation. He talks about body language. We talked about that before, so I'm not going to hit that one too much. But then he talks about uh, you know, building that rapport. Uh, and the, basically, there's two elements. Now, expressing that you care. They need to understand that. And then also that I'm just like you. And that's kind of in that president, in that Independence Day speech. He He does that. He expresses that he cares, you know, that we're all in this together. We're fighting from the threat of annihilation, and I'm just like you. And he actually gets in one of those planes and he flies up, and he, yeah. you know, he puts his own life on the line. Yeah, and so and he's got the the, the body language and um, the tonality, and his tone he starts low, and then it increases to where he's almost yelling at the end. So you you kind of see all those elements in the, that speech that he gave. So anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. So as as we typically do um, with our. Uh, maybe our research episodes is we kind of put together maybe a little bit of quote or advice or yeah. uh, something that, that, that we would say that we uh, maybe, maybe would help us in the future. So uh, Jared and I put those together. I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. So I said, when you are given the opportunity to speak to people with authority, plan, prepare, and practice, do everything you can to connect with your audience. Only then will they remember what you said. Yeah. If you don't connect with your audience, they're not going to remember so nope. what. And maybe they won't remember exactly what you said, but they'd probably remember how you how they felt. Exactly. They'll remember how they feel. Mike, what is this? Speaking with power and confidence is one of the greatest superpowers a man can possess. Nice. You know, if you can speak well and you can convince people, there is no limit to what you can do. Yeah. It will, it will open doors for you. You know, I was in a... I had the privilege of being on a, a hiring interview the other day. Uh, we were, someone was trying to get a job at the company that I work at, and you know they do a presentation. Uh, they do a presentation on a case study that they we've sent them, and this this person that did the uh, interview just totally failed miserably. And the not person only, who was conducting the interview, no, or no the, the person the interviewee, was, the interviewee, the person that was interview. Yeah, the interviewee, the person that was applying for the job, totally botched the interview. Uh, and it was evident in one, the preparation. There was very little preparation. In fact, the person said, yeah, I actually just prepared this this past weekend. It was a long weekend. I'm like, 
you know, I was like, when I applied, when I got got my job, I did that. Ca- I I spent like probably twenty hours on that case throughout the whole week or more, and I absolutely nailed that part of the interview. In fact, that was the easiest part of the interview for me. Like presenting, I'm like, heck yeah, that's the easiest part because there was also like a technical review that that they did. But it's just interesting how she was unprepared unpre- for the the this interview her slides didn't make any sense what she was showing on her slides didn't convey the message that she was trying to say she just wanted to showcase that she could you know write python code and she could pull out cool charts from python but the charts didn't mean anything in context of what the message was that she was trying to say so she just got all tangled up in herself because she didn't know what she was saying she didn't know why she had put a chart on the deck Maybe she was qualified, but she was, she, the presentation she wasn't. Did, yeah, she she had the technical skills definitely, but she did not have the pres the presentation skills, or the the communication skills. Communication skills to, to to do the job, and that is so important. I mean, I'm just like, man, if you had practiced more, if you had had somebody look at your deck, if you had ran someone through these things, you would have had the you would have had a new job now because it was the final round. But you know, it, it, it's definitely impactful, and if you're Sitting there right now, it's like, oh, I, I don't need this help. You're joking yourself because you absolutely do need this help, and uh, even we do. Uh, everybody does. You can always get better at doing this, and the more, the better you get, the more powerful you become. Yeah, and I guess last thing to go along with that, um, if you haven't listened to it, our episode "Confidence versus Arrogance." Um, that is one where we talk about uh, basically maybe. Too much confidence, right? Was that a loyalist episode? It might have been. It actually was a Patreon episode. I think it was. Yeah. So if you want to listen to that episode, it's really cool. Go to uh, our our Patreon link in the description. Uh, For $5 a month, you can join our our loyalist program and get two extra episodes a month where we talk about really cool stuff. And then all the ones in the past. So arrogance versus confidence confidence and everything else that goes into it. But... Uh, yeah, but just just build that confidence. Maybe that confidence is just self confidence, and it'll 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 show through. It'll show through. Absolutely. Just be calm, calm, cool, and collected. Well, this has been a, a excellent one. I've I've had a, a lot of I've loved looking at this one, and I feel like I've said a lot less, a lot fewer ums and ands in this one than I than I have previously. So I'll try to continue that trend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this definitely was good for me as well. Uh, definitely something that I will take a lot of these points in my own life. Well, thank you all. Follow us on socials. We usually post something every single day about the episode we've just done. And then we just share kind of general stuff about our lives, um, post yep. stuff about what we're doing with the kids or whatnot. So we're also on TikTok. Ethan's our TikTok master here. <laughs> yeah. On on all all socials, it's just a.brothers.creed. Uh, you can just search us and you'll find us. So we'd love to hear your feedback and maybe what you're interested in hearing more about. So thank you for joining and let's build that creed together. All right, let's do it.